building a better Bay Area. Moving forward, finding solutions. This is ABC 7 News. Hi there, I'm Kristen Z. You're watching Getting Answers live on ABC7. Every day we talk with experts about issues important to the Bay Area and we get answers for you in real time. Today we have earth-shaking news. A new Stanford study reveals there's a system of faults deep under Silicon Valley that may be able to cause a quake bigger than Loma Prieta, or at least equal to it. The lead author of the study will be joining us live. Also, a massive skyscraper could change San Francisco's skyline forever. The 50 Main Street Tower would add 808 homes to the city and would be the second tallest building behind Salesforce Tower. Our media partners at the San Francisco Standard will be here to show us this new proposal. But first, the CDC is changing what it means to be up to date on COVID vaccines. And most of us have caught COVID at least once by now, but if you get it and again and again, does that increase your chances of having long COVID? Joining us live now to discuss the latest COVID news is UCSF Chair of the Department of Medicine, Dr. Bob Wachter. Dr. Wachter, it's been a while, so great to see you. It has, nice to see you as well. All right, so big question here we start with, has COVID gone away? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, whatever we call it, whether we call it pandemic or not, there still is COVID around. I'm afraid there still will be COVID around probably forever. Uh, the threat is lower than it was, so it's appropriate for people to be able to do some different things than they've been doing, but there is still COVID and I think it's still worth taking seriously. All right, so speaking of taking it seriously, the CDC has just changed what being up to date on vaccinations means. What was it before and what is it now? Yeah, there are new, there are new uh, guidelines say that up to date is you got your primary series and now you've gotten the latest vaccine or, or the latest booster. And um, uh, previously they really didn't account for, uh, for this new booster. And I think that, that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I think for many of us who've been sort of following along, uh, we're on our fifth uh, shot. I've, I am on, I've had five shots, uh, but at very least at this point, I think people should have had, you need to have had, had a booster. If you just have had your original two shots, uh, calling that and fully vaccinated is just not right. You are vulnerable, your immunity has gone down considerably. So making sure that you've had the latest vaccine on top of the original two uh, is what I think of as being up to date. Okay, so just to clarify, because I'm still not totally clear on it, uh, maybe I'm just a little slow today, I didn't have my second cup of coffee, um, but does that mean original series plus a booster or this new bivalent booster to be considered I think they're, up to date. I, I think they're calling it I've got to go back and look but I think they are saying that you need to have had the latest booster that is available so I, I I have to go back and check but I believe it is that being up to date is that you have had your original shots and at least the latest booster that's available, which in this case would be the bivalent. Ooh, okay, bivalent. that means I'm actually not up to date. But um, look, less than 8 million Americans have gotten the new one, right? I wonder if that slow uptake or low uptake worries you? Not, not yet. I mean, it, it is a little worrisome that more people haven't gotten it because I think if you got your last booster in 2021, 20, uh, if you're a year out, your protection has waned considerably and you will be better off. Your chances of getting sick, hospitalized and dying would go down considerably if you got this booster. Now, there may be people out there who are waiting until cases are higher. There may be people out there who haven't gotten a booster for a while, but they got COVID two months ago. That doesn't worry me if those people have not gotten their booster now. I think it's perfectly reasonable for them to wait a little while. But if those numbers don't tick up, particularly if cases start increasing, which I think mm -hmm. is likely in the next few months, then that will worry me a lot because we'll just be having a lot of preventable cases and some preventable deaths. Okay, so actually that is me. A lot of us got Omicron probably, right, BA4 or 5 over the summer. How long do you think I wait before I get the bivalent booster? There's no bright line. I think I'm going with a general rule of three months after your last uh, booster or your last infection. Mm -hmm. We know that your protection from either a prior booster or a prior infection begins to wane in terms of your protection against getting COVID after about a couple of months. And so you can make an argument to get a little bit sooner, but the cases in the Bay Area are so low right now 
that and and the booster is not going to last forever in terms of preventing infection mm -hmm. that it's a little it's kind of a judgment call whether you get it now or you wait a month or so what i wouldn't wait is more than four or five months after your prior booster or after your prior infection because by that time your protection against getting infected uh, infected has gone down considerably and you're beginning to lose some protection against getting a severe infection. Okay. Dr. Walker, new studies suggest that the antiviral Paxlovid really, really works. Tell us about it. Yeah, this is a study that's using what is called real-world evidence. And so it's, it's just looking at uh, patients who were taken care of in hospitals or health systems that use a, a, an electronic health record called EPIC. And what they did was they looked at people who got Paxlovid, and other people who appeared to be eligible for it and did not. Mm -hmm. And it was about two thirds of the people were in that latter category, meaning a lot of people who are eligible for Paxlovid are not getting it either because the patients don't want it or their doctors are not giving it. And it showed that across different age groups, different vaccination status, the chances of hospitalization and the chances of death were considerably lower in people who got Paxlovid than didn't. So to my mind, it confirms what the randomized studies showed which is if you are eligible for it, meaning you're, you're over, I think it's over 50, um, you should get it. And I mean, there's been a fair amount of concern about Paxlovid rebound. I think Paxlovid rebound is a real phenomenon, uh, but Paxlovid rebound doesn't change the numbers. The numbers show that if you get it, compared to people who didn't get it, if you get Paxlovid, your chances of being hospitalized and dying go down considerably. Do you also look at these same numbers showing Paxlovid's effectiveness and think, hmm, this could be used to argue that we should lower the eligibility requirements for Paxlovid and doctors should really prescribe it a lot more to a lot more people? Probably, you know, probably not. I think the, the, the two pieces of data I'd love to see on Paxlovid, one is a, a 10 day versus a five day course because it's possible that some of the rebound is because the course is too soon. We don't know that yet. The second is, does Paxlovid have an impact on long COVID? And we don't know that yet either. There's reason to be hopeful about that, but we don't have any data on that. Until there's data on that, saying that a healthy 30-year-old should get Paxlovid when Paxlovid's main demonstrated effect is lowering the chance of hospitalization. If you're a healthy 30-year-old who's vaccinated, your chances of hospitalization and death are really, really low. Okay. So my, my kids got it who are at around 30 mm -hmm. and, and they're fully vaccinated. I would not recommend they take Paxlovid at this point. Okay. Uh, your wife, the glorious author, Katie Hafner, did take Paxlovid and she did have a rebound uh, and she also had some longer COVID symptoms, if you will. How is she doing now? Thank you for asking. She is, uh, and she is a wonderful author, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> Katie is feeling, I, she, she would say 90% better. So, so uh, she's improved considerably over the last three months, but she's now six months out from her case of COVID. And if she works and thinks what she does for a living for three or four hours in the morning, she needs to take a nap, which she never had to do prior to six months ago. So she sometimes bristles when I say she has long COVID. She says, oh, I'm better, not really. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that her brain is not quite where it was and her level of fatigue is higher than it was. And that's probably the most common thing that we see when we have long COVID. It's not disabling in her case, but it certainly is harming her quality of life. The good news, it's gotten a little bit better every week over the last few months, and I hope it will continue to get better. Hopefully, yeah, soon. Um, look, many of us have had COVID now, right? And for those of, us, those of us who had a pretty mild case, there may be the tendency to think, okay, I can handle this. If I were to get reinfected, I, I'm okay. But is there any data that suggests that if you get reinfected, like maybe second time, third time, fourth time, you're more likely to get long COVID? Yeah, there is There's data that says that First of all, your long-term outcomes, when we look at the outcomes of people a year later, people who had multiple infections do worse than people who had a single infection. And the second is with each episode of COVID, there is a chance that you will have long COVID. So the fact that you dodged it with your first episode is not a guarantee you'll continue to dodge it on your second. Mm. You know, the fact that you had a first episode does give you some additional protection against getting infected for a while, as we discussed, but it's not a get out of jail free card. And to me, I've never had it. The level of care that I, you know, my level of caution to prevent a case now, I think is no different than my wife's is, even though she had it once before. We both feel like 
if we get it, there is a chance, not super high, but high enough mm -hmm. that we will get very sick and there is a chance we will get long COVID. And that chance is probably about the same for her on her second infection as it would be for me on my first. All right. Well, right now, Dr. Walker, we're in kind of a lull here, right? Uh, although if you look at Europe, UK, I think cases are going back up. I wonder when you look at the big picture, and I know you always do a little bit of forecasting too, are you comfortable eating in restaurants right now? Are you doing that again? I am. I ate inside last night, but I'm eating outside with faculty and our and residents here tonight and tomorrow night. So when I have a choice and, you know, the weather's okay, I prefer outside to inside because I think you are taking a little bit of a risk. But the the rate is low enough now that I am comfortable eating inside if that's the if that's the best alternative. If the case rate goes up considerably, then I will change that. But right now it's pretty low in the Bay Area. If I had to take a guess, I would say it'll stay low for a month or two, and then all bets are off over the winter. I think the best guess would be that the case rates are going to start going up again. All right. So in the 10 seconds we have left, the best way to protect ourselves before the winter surge hopefully won't come, but if it's here? Get your vaccine if you haven't gotten one in the last three or four months, and, uh, and do wear a mask in crowded indoor spaces and wear a good mask. Dr. Bob Wachter, always great talking with you, and please give our best to Katie. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, new concerns over fault lines in Silicon Valley. Researchers say they're poised to unleash a major earthquake. We'll talk with one of them to find out why next on Getting Answers. In commercial break. Welcome back. Whether you just moved to the Bay Area or have lived here for decades, you know earthquakes are a reality. You've probably heard of the Hayward Fault or the San Andreas Fault, but now a new study is shining light on a system of earthquake faults that most of us don't even know exists. It's called the Foothill Thrust Belt Faults. They run deep under Silicon Valley, extending from Palo Alto to just south of Gilroy, flanked by the Santa Cruz Mountains. Researchers at Stanford found out these faults are capable of generating a magnitude 6.9 quake. Joining us live now with more on this, on the risks, is Felipe Aron, a lead author on the study and postdoctoral scholar at Stanford. Thank you so much for joining us, Felipe. Hello, thank you for your invitation. Well, we want to learn more about the Foothill Thrust Bell Faults. How long have scientists known about them being there? 
Uy, uh, those faults, um, uh, they have been known for a long time, I would say 20, 30 years at least. Uh, they were uh, discovered by scientists at, at the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, which, which have done a, a very detailed work in the area constraining the hazards and the, the geology of, of the place. So, so, so we didn't discover those faults in this study at all. Okay, they have been discovered, but you were able to quantify their potential energy and destructive capabilities. And I know in your paper you said it's capable of the 6.9. We remember the Loma Prieta quake in 1989. I think that was a 6.9. Um, that was so damaging. How destructive could a shaker be on the foothill thrust belt be? Correct. So how destructive that can be, that's not really part of our study. That's that's um, in not jurisdiction as, uh, as scientists of fundamental science. We we try to come out with the, those metrics that can tell you about the potential, as you well said, the energy potential of the, those earthquakes can happen. But then how that's going to translate to damage, it depends on many factors. And, and for example, the quality of the soils, uh, the way the, the depth of the nucleation of the earthquakes, etc. So, so, so you can imagine what happened during the Loma Prieta earthquake, as you said. So, you could expect something similar. But the details about that—that's something that needs to be constrained by the people that uh, really come out with those uh, estimations. Okay, but you mentioned the soil, which leads me to this, because I think you studied these faults through a simulation that accounts for the landscape, right? Can you explain what you right. learned? Yeah, so one of the novelties of this work is that we were able to use um, um, a metric which is not, uh, which is dependent on the, on, the, on the activity of the fault, which is basically, every time one of those faults move, they uh, move up and down the, the, the big blocks of the earth. So the mountains that you see in the Bay Area, for example, uh, that are flanking the Silicon Valley, they, they are most, mostly formed by the activity of those faults. So they contain the information of how they behave, they have behaved in the past. So we, we, we specifically, we were able to connect the shape of the rivers that are formed on those uplifted mountains to infer what are the uh, um, the slip rates or, or the earthquake accumulation rates that those faults uh, um, uh, produce over the past that were responsible of creating those mountain ranges. So connecting uh, to apparently unrelated processes like mountain form formation, mountain formation, uh, river formation with earthquake activity was one of the main novelties of uh, our work, basically. Okay, um, but you're not forecasting that a quake will definitely happen there, right? Right. So, as I said before, so this fundamental science, which are the quantification or the un unknown metrics, before uh, most be unknown metrics on those faults, uh, they have to be taken and put into models. And this is a this is sort of this is a chain work that uh, considers many other variables as well which are all put together to estimate those forecasting um, uh, um, assessments, basically. So, so again, this is one of the uh, fundamental and basic metrics that you need to enter into those more complex models that determine what's, what's going to be the impact of those earthquakes and also what is the probability or the likelihood of, of an earthquake of a specific magnitude happens in the, in the near future. But then we know in the Bay Area, those will, will happen again. It's not new. Uh, news that 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 uh, the area is going to be affected in the relatively recent uh, future by by earthquakes. It's the the, the thing is that we need to learn how to uh, live with that hazard mm -hmm. and then adapt in accordingly to that. And then in order to adapt well, we need to get to know how they behave. And that's one of the contributions of our study, basically. So based on what you've learned about this new system of faults, is there anything you think people who live in the Silicon Valley need to do differently to prepare well so uh well you have to be prepared as you said and then uh and then uh the, the culture about earthquakes in the bay area is very rich same as in chile where i am right now so 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 uh so it, it's always good to revisit all the codes and the specific um um guidelines that have been used to construct the current infra infrastructure, for example, but when you plan ahead, in the, in, well, you need to plan ahead in order to build up the expansion of the cities. And then, and then for that, you need to take in, into account the, that those fundamental science uh, studies that we present and, and, and the work that the USGS 
uh, does to constrain the hazards in order to build better, basically. So, so, so science is an important thing to consider when you want to plan on for uh, developing sustainable and, and, and resilient societies in the future. So, so basically get informed and get prepared. That's what people have to do. All right, Stanford's Felipe Aron, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. By the You're way, very folks, welcome. Thank you. We just want to let you know on ABC7 News website, we do have a prepare NorCal section. If you're looking for resources on how to prepare your earthquake kit and be prepared for your family. All right, coming up, hundreds of new homes, plus a new look for San Francisco skyline. It could be coming soon if developers get their wish. Our media partners at the San Francisco Standard will be here to tell us about the project next on Getting Answers. Salesforce Tower, watch out. There may soon be another mega skyscraper, perhaps not quite as tall, but hoping to make as big of a splash on the San Francisco skyline and the South of Market neighborhood. Our media partners at the San Francisco Standard just published an article previewing 50 Main Street. It will contain more than 800 rental units and, according to the developers, boost the recovery of the downtown area. Joining us live now is the Standard's reporter, Garrett Leahy. Garrett, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Kristen. All right, so tell us, what do you know about this proposed skyscraper on the drawing board? Yeah, so this skyscraper, as proposed, would be 992 feet high, second only to the Salesforce Tower in height, about 70 feet shorter. It would be in the Soma neighborhood. It'd have 808 units of housing, of which 118 would be affordable units. All right, we're taking a close look at it. What The design, the architecture is kind of interesting. Are those open gaps kind of in the middle where I see some foliage and trees? That's right. So they're actually cross braces meant to seismically reinforce the building. Um, that's the reason for its interesting facade, you could say. Okay, that actually makes it seismically stronger. Okay. Um, hey, what is there currently? So right now at that site, there's actually a two-story office building on that block. So that office building would be demolished to accommodate the infill development of this skyscraper. And is it part of a larger development? Yeah, so it's one of four buildings that would be on that block as part of the block's redevelopment. There would be the uh, building at 50 Main Street, which would be all residential. And the other four would have a mixture of office and retail space, along with another acre or so of publicly available open space to fill in the rest of the area on that block. And this is near transit, right? Yeah, it's near the Embarcadero, BART, and Muni stations. It's also near the Transbay Terminal and the Ferry Building. So it's a, a close to transit afford, uh, housing development. What's been the reaction to it so far? 
So what we've seen so far, at least on Twitter, is that there have been positive reactions to the construction of this building, but uh, we'll see how things shake out in terms of public opinion as more details about the building come to light and as the timeline for when this actually gets built uh, begins to progress further. All right, the residential tower on Main Street, I'm wondering, though, is this type of housing that housing advocates are really actually pushing for, right? Because the majority of these units, I imagine, will be super luxury and unaffordable to most. Well, well yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, this kind of strikes at the center of a housing debate in San Francisco, often between progressives and moderates, um, where progressives will often demand or or. Uh, take the position that there needs to be a higher threshold, a higher amount of affordable housing in a given development, whereas uh, YIMBYs and moderates will often say that there needs to be a more, as they would say, reasonable amount of affordable housing to make these buildings profitable enough that developers will actually want to build in San Francisco. So there's no real numbers released as of yet for what the rents of this building are going to be like. Mm -hmm. But given that it's, you know, a, in a, a nice part of town, appears to be a luxury building, we can expect the rents will be fairly high. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, if they'll be able to fill in the sense that the main target demo group that would want to live in a place like that is probably the high salary young tech workers, many of whom are now working remotely and not in the city necessarily. So we'll see. Of course, this takes a long time for it to actually materialize. Um, but I want to ask you about the developer. Isn't that the same developer who built 33 Tehama, the luxury high rise that's been flooding due to water main breaks? I think would that give the city pause? Yeah, that's a very good question. So indeed, there have been issues with the 33 Tahama building of which Heinz is the owner and developer. It flooded twice in two and uh, three months in the summer. Um, but we, well, we can't really say if it should give us pause at Heinz the developer because we haven't actually seen any sort of technical plans about the building so we could see or any expert could see any red flags in the actual construction. So we'll okay. have to be following those developments and see whether Heinz will actually um, you know, if, if this building will be up to snuff. All right. I guess in the 30 seconds we have left, where are we in terms of the green lighting process? I think we're on the early stage, right? What's coming up? Yes, it's very early. So it's all still preliminary. The developers are actually going to be going to the plan commission on the 6th to give an informational presentation and solicit early feedback on the construction. So there's still no timeline for when this would break ground or when it would be approved. We're still waiting to see how all that plays out. All right. Well, we'll continue to follow it on the S of Standard. Garrett, don't go away because I would love to continue our conversation over on Facebook Live um, during our commercial break coming up. But folks, you do want to check out more of the San Francisco Standard's other original reporting on their website, sfstandard.com. And ABC7 will continue to bring you more segments featuring the Standard's city-focused journalism. We'll take a short break and be right back on the air. In commercial break. All right. And Garrett's still with us, yes? I'm still here. Yay, okay, Garrett, I can't tell because I see commercial, but I hear your voice, so that's good. Um, but I want to ask you whether this particular project in this particular form eventually gets green-lighted. Does it seem like this is kind of continuing our march towards becoming more New York City-like? That is, you know, growing upwards and, and, and you know, towards the sky and having less open space, which is kind of this struggle that you know, the Bay Area is also kind of soul searching, like, what do we want to be, right? Yeah, well, you know, in, in terms of kind of the develop, the, I guess, controversy around high rise building in San Francisco, um, I, I think, you know, the concern is that, you know, people are worried about, especially building high rises on like the western side of the city, because they're worried about, um, you know, kind of changing the suburban nature of those particular neighborhoods. Certainly the eastern side of the city where these developments are going up have a, a history of having high rise buildings. Uh, so I, I'm unsure if there will be a lot of controversy around these buildings for uh, their height necessarily compared to if they were developed in other parts of the city. Got it. Um, do you think the fact that um, earthquakes are always a concern here will factor into, I know we have high rises, but certainly when you have many, many more high rises, that raises the issue of, you know, increased risk. And we also have the millennium, which is starting to, you know, tilt. And, and I think, I feel like, you know, are there seismic questions to be addressed for these developers? You know, it, it's tough for me to say, uh, you know, certainly if you build a really tall thousand foot skyscraper, you have to get creative when it comes to seismic abatement. 
Uh, but you know, somebody who's not of a geotechnical uh, background, uh, it's, it's tough for me to really say with any authority as to what specifically needs to happen or what concerns there may be seismically with building high rises. But um, you Fair know, hopefully if, oh, go ahead. No, 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 that's okay. I think we're out of time, but I do want to thank you, Garrett. It was a pleasure talking with you and I do hope folks will check out your article on sfstandard.com. Likewise, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today on Getting Answers. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. Coming up at 4 p.m. today, a look ahead to San Francisco's Fleet Week activities. A lot going on. Blue Angels. World News Tonight with David Muir is coming up next. And I'll see you back here at 4.